morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. Can you have integrity in Hollywood? Can you say no to Marvel? These are questions that Edgar Wright suddenly found himself being the poster boy for when he infamously walked away from Ant-Man and Marvel Studios after eight years of development and already beginning the casting process. And for quite some time it looked like he was going to be a cautionary tale that no, you could not do those things without seriously damaging your career. And it did seem that Edgar Wright would never get the chance to direct a Hollywood blockbuster again. After all, what studio would want to go into business with a director who would say no and potentially walk away from a project uh, at the 11th hour? And Ant-Man is still reeling from the damage done to their uh, the image for that film, and you can see them still trying to work damage control. As we discussed, Evangeline Lilly and Judy Greer have been talking quite a bit about why Edgar Wright uh, had to leave and why it was the best choice for everyone involved. And I'm sure Edgar Wright's like, not me really, but uh, I digress. But anyway, Edgar Wright, uh, the passage of time seems to heal all wounds and all reputations, and it looks like he might actually bounce back from this thing, and to such a degree that he could be the big winner of the day if Ant-Man continues to suffer from uh, problems, if it's not a good film, if Peyton Reed at the helm doesn't uh, manage to do a good job, and if Paul Rudd and Adam McKay didn't fix Edgar Wright's scripts in the way that they think they did, uh, and that he succeeds with one of these, not one, but two films that he's up for, Wright will be victorious and show that you can have integrity and you can say no to Marvel. So very interesting developments indeed. So we're going to discuss both projects that Wright is up for. Uh, he has competition, some serious competition on one of them, but we're going to talk about first about the bigger deal and that's Star Trek III. Now, Roberto Orchard was supposed to direct this film, uh, but he, uh, for reasons that have not been made known, decided to step back, and he'll still be producing. Roberto Orchi is a very big screenwriter in Hollywood. He usually teams up with Alex Kurtzman. Uh, Kurtzman, of course, is now, they've decided to go solo recently, and, and Kurtzman is over at Universal, uh, you know, revamping and rebooting their uh, uni uh, Universal Monsters line, and that's going to be its own cinematic universe. We've been talking about that quite a bit, and that's coming along quite nicely. But Roberto Orchi, say, was Star Trek. Uh, he not only produces the films, but uh, he works on like oversee helps to oversee the comic books over at IDW. Really hands on with the franchise, and he was going to make his directorial debut here. And I think that it's best for everybody to step down. Uh, as I've said many times before, I think it's never a good idea for a director to cut their teeth um, on a big franchise picture because it takes at least one movie, I think, for a director to really understand visual effects filmmaking. Look at the difference, for instance, between. Uh, X-Men and X2, or even James Cameron, a master of visual effects. Look at how he's exponentially improved with each movie. And I think that, uh, with all due respect to Roberto Orci, uh, I think that Star Trek as a, as a franchise, this, this new rebooted version, can't afford to have someone have the time to find their voice and to learn special effects filmmaking. It has a lot of damage control to do after Star Trek Into Darkness. I know some of you enjoyed that movie, but overall it was not particularly well received. Uh, and I think that they need someone in there who really knows what they're doing. So Roberta Orchi again stepped down and then Edgar Wright's name immediately was mentioned as someone that Paramount was seriously looking at. And you can't help but wonder if his good friend Simon Pegg was like, hey, I know someone who's available and he really would like to make a big boss a blockbuster film. And of course this would be wonderful for Paramount because they of course lost J.J. Abrams to Disney, uh, you know, to this, the Star Wars franchise and I'm sure they'd be like, this is great, let's take one of Disney's and one that kind of, you know, if we succeed with him it'll give Disney a, a bit of a black eye. So I think, I think Edgar Wright would actually be quite an interesting choice for the new Star Trek uh, a series of films. I think they're a little bit more comedic. Uh, that's something that J.J. Abrams I think introduced quite well, especially in the first uh, film, uh, the 2009 entry. I thought Chris Pine could be quite funny. And Spock, Edgar Wright and Spock, how great would that be? And of course Scotty would certainly have more to do if Edgar Wright was at the helm. I think he's a very good fit with the material, uh, and I think he can do a very good action sequence. I, I think the best part of Scott Pilgrim uh, were the action sequences. They were exciting, they were adventurous, and they were unique. They, he did a lot of outside-of-the-box thinking. And of course, when you see Ant-Man fight, don't forget that Edgar Wright had a lot to do with coming up with that style of fighting, uh, you know, using the momentum of shrinking, uh, going from small to big, actually, you know, reverse shrinking, to add momentum to a kick or a punch. Very clever. Very, very clever indeed. So I think that Edgar Wright would be a great choice. So uh, that's something that he's considering, and I, if I had to tell him which to pick, I, I would say to go with that one. Uh, and he might not even have a choice because the second film that we're going to discuss right now has a lot of directors that Warner Brothers is considering. Now, Warner Brothers is developing franchises like a studio on fire. They've already got 
uh, of course, the DC films, the Harry Potter films, which they're not, they're not letting that franchise die. Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson said just last week that they're going to maybe try and find a way to make more of those movies. They now have their Lego brand, which is incredibly successful. Uh, it's a front runner for the Oscars in the animation category, believe it or not. Uh, and so they have a lot of different franchises already at the studio. But that's not enough. They want to develop another one. And this is uh, based on the novel Ready Player One. And it's a video game uh, based novel, but it takes place in, a, you know, of course, a dystopian future uh, where this, uh, this young man, what's his name here? I have it written down here. Um, his name is Wade Watts. And Wade Watts escapes his bleak uh, life by playing this uh, game, this virtual reality game. And it's created by someone who, like a mysterious figure, uh, like an Oz figure, and he's obsessed with pop culture. So a lot of the trivia and the challenges in the game are based on 80s pop culture. So Wade Watts discovers that if he can solve the game, he will discover this horrible or interesting secret and incredible power and wealth. But of course, a lot of people want to discover that. So the novel is about uh, this deadly competition to uh, solve the game and maybe save the world. Uh, and Warner Brothers is very excited about this. So I would say that the title is fantastic. Ready Player One, just of course, you know, you're about to play a game. How exciting is that? But I think that the 80s nostalgia trip is potentially a mistake. It reminds me of like Tron meets Logan's Run meets The Running Man. Uh, and all those films, I think, not particularly successful. I think that they have their place in Hollywood, you know, kitsch history, and I think most cinephiles are familiar with them, but they are not these beloved franchises with these huge fan bases. And I just think that 80s trivia, I, I think that if I had to guess that Warner Brothers is like, look how much everybody loved the soundtrack for Guardians of the Galaxy. But there's a lot more to Guardians of the Galaxy than just, you know, an 80s redux. And I love the Goldbergs probably more than the next person, but I don't think that I would want, would want to watch an entire film about uh, you know, an action film, no less, about 80s trivia. Uh, I just, I think that it has a very limited scope in terms of appeal. But they're really sold on this, and they have, they're offering it to all their big guns. So not only is Edgar Wright well, a name that's being considered by Warner Brothers, but they're considering their two big in-house directors, Christopher Nolan and Peter Jackson, but then also Robert Zemeckis, and that's apparently their top choice because apparently the book references Robert Zemeckis' work. Although I would say, hey, you know, Robert Zemeckis hasn't made this type of a film for a very long time, and I don't know if he still has it in him. So I, and I don't even know Robert Zemeckis still has that businessman inside of him that can make a movie that can do well. I think he's been distracted by wanting to win awards and technology, etc. Uh, I think he's just lost as a creative voice at this point. And then also Matthew Vaughn for X-Men First Class and the upcoming Kingsman The Secret Service. Although any movie that gets pushed to February is a little worrisome, even though I think Kingsman The Secret Service looks very good. So the other big takeaway from this, besides uh, Edgar Wright being uh, considered for this film as well, is that Christopher Nolan doesn't get first dibs. Uh, he's in the mix, and I think that's an interesting place for Christopher Nolan to find himself post-Interstellar. I think pre-Interstellar, Christopher Nolan wouldn't be in the mix anywhere. Either he wants it or he doesn't, and then we can go to other people if he turns it down. But the fact that he now finds himself competing with these other directors who have also had misfires, I think speaks very strongly to what the, the damage that Interstellar has already done to his career. Uh, I don't think Christopher Nolan would take this anyway. I think it's not a good fit with him, but we'll see. I think Edgar Wright would also be well would be, be good here, but I think Edgar Wright might put it a little bit too much in its own head. Too much 80s trivia. A little too close to Scott Pilgrim. I think he needs more mainstream material, so he should stick with Star Trek, and I think, um, you know, I don't know who, maybe Matthew Vaughn I would pick here. I don't have very much faith in this property, Ready Player One, so uh, good luck to whoever takes the gig. I think it's kind of like a, a faulty uh, booby trap. Uh, it's a trap! It's a trap! Don't sign on for this movie. But I'm curious, has anyone here read Ready Player One? Do you think it would make a good movie? And if you haven't read it, does it sound like a movie you want to watch? Now, the third story of the day, talking about movies that you want to watch, is the world of movie theaters and how they're becoming increasingly competitive to uh, get you to attend their specific theater. Of course, there was that story about AMC deciding to uh, redo a number of their theaters and, and um, it, it, coming up with 2015 because there are so many big movies coming up. They want to do them all as recliners with reserved seating, you know, change a considerable amount of their theaters over to that format to, to be extra competitive in 2015 with so many big movies hitting the silver screen. Now, of course, IMAX is a, is a, a big get. It's considered many people's first choice for how they want to watch a movie these days, especially these kind of big blockbusters that are going to make a lot of money in 2015. And because of that, uh, other theaters are trying to create an alternative to IMAX. Now, of course, IMAX has had problems. Uh, IMAX has had the baby IMAX, uh, you know, controversy about how they will put their brand on a theater screen that's not 
five stories tall. And, you know, Issa Sansari wrote a really great blog post about that a couple of years ago at this point, and I think that not everybody thinks of IMAX the way they should, and that's those Broadway and 68th Street Theater. That's the ideal IMAX viewing experience. Otherwise, it's just, you know, quality of sound and, uh, video and visuals. So, and also the other controversy with IMAX, of course, is they're getting into business with um, special releasing of films. For instance, uh, the Weinstein Company says they're going to release Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon 2, the sequel, on Netflix and only IMAX theaters. And that upset a number of theater chains saying, well, you're in my theater, IMAX, so you can't play the movie. And Harvey Weinstein was like, I thought they had that all sewn up. This is embarrassing and annoying, but whatever. But so anyway... Other theaters are trying to create an alternative to IMAX. You have Regal's RPX, you have AMC Prime. I think it used to be called EPX, but they've redubbed it as AMC Prime, renamed it. But then also now, Dolby is getting into the mix, and they sent me a nice press release about this. As you know, Dolby is very kind to give us uh, Blu-rays. They've given us two at this point to give away. We had Transformers, Age of Extinction, and Step Up All In. Uh, and they also wanted to let you know about this theater system they're developing to compete with IMAX, etc. So what is going to be unique about this? Well, uh, you can check out their website. There's a link in the video description. They have uh, artist renderings, and they have uh, you know a very detailed presentation of what Dolby, uh, Dolby Cinema, it's going to be called, has to offer. But of course, it features Dolby Atmos uh, sound technology, which is something that is on all their Blu-rays, and that's why they've been wanting to let you know about them, why they've been giving us the Blu-rays to give away. Uh, so they'll have the sound, the Dolby Atmos sound, where they can place sound specifically within the theater. That's going to be in these Dolby Cinemas. Then also, it's going to have an increased quality in terms of the visuals, in terms of the technology of uh, the projection. It's going to try and use a color palette that's the closest to the human eye as possible. And then also the theater design is, uh, spo is supposed to achieve things uh, in two fronts. One, it's supposed to direct your attention to the screen, to really not distract you. You know, sometimes they try and make theater seem a little homey. Well, this is going to try and really point all your attention to the big, beautiful picture in front of you. And then the other thing is they're trying to make it seem very much like an event. When you walk into this theater, uh, it's a time to be excited about the movie you're about to see on the screen. So they're very excited about this, and they have two slated to open, actually internationally. This is an international uh, business venture, and so BTT has viewers all over the globe. So if you live in the Netherlands near Eindhoven, you're going to be getting a Dolby Cinema. And if you live in uh, or near Barcelona, Spain, you will also be getting a Dolby Cinema. So I'm curious as to what you guys think of this, and also... Which way do you like to watch a movie? Is there a brand that's the most important to you? Have you had bad experiences with the baby IMAX? Uh, you know, what is your preference for movie going? And what is the, what, what do you value the most? Is it picture and sound quality? Is it the, you know, the security of the theater in terms of, you know, not talking and people not being on your phone, on their phones? What, what, uh, what is the ideal movie going experience to you? Uh, and what is the most important? All right, so those are the three stories of the day. Now, the viewer questions uh, comes from Dominic Samaru. And Dominic's been asking this question for a little bit now since Big Hero 6 came out. And he hasn't given up and he's been very polite about it. So I could not ignore it any longer. It's a little bit of a difficult question, but I think it's worth discussing. I, I, I certainly applaud uh, Dominic's patience, politeness, and persistence. So Dominic says, question, please answer my question while it's still relevant. Okay, Dominic. Uh, do you think that films for kids should be as direct as possible with their moral messages and themes to ensure that people, even critics, quote-unquote, get them? Or do you think they should be more subliminal? Children's films these days are delving deeper and deeper into mature themes that are, that are usually even avoided in adult films. And I'm just uncertain whether the subtlety of an indie film is appropriate when the audience is so big and even young. Thank you. Love the show. I've been watching for two years now, and you already answered a handful of questions, which really made me uh, get hooked on the show. Smiley face and a big smiley face. I uh, respect your reviews immensely. I think he added that because I didn't think much of Big Hero 6. And I know that I remember Dominic commenting and some other people commenting that they did value the message of Big Hero 6, and that's coping with loss. Now, my answer to this is that I think the Big Hero 6 and Frozen, as well, both, uh, both Disney pictures, did try to address larger issues. But I think they were a little sloppy with them, and I don't think that it's that they were subtle. Again, I think it's that they were sloppy. And I think it's because they don't have enough time to appropriately explore these issues and the, you know, the amount of time they allot for their films. If you want to take on these big, heavy issues, you need more time. You need to make two and a two and a half hour animated movie. 
Uh, and then also, I think they have too much to accomplish. They have too big a cast of characters. They have, you know, they want to not only make people think, but they want to make them laugh. They want to add some romance, etc. There are just so many elements they want to incorporate. Uh, I think Frozen perhaps did a little bit of a better job in Big Hero 6 because it really wore its message on its sleeve, and that's sisterly love over romantic love. Um, and I think that, that was very powerful with a lot of people. Also, that has messages on two fronts. Also, the let it go, be who you be who you are, and don't worry what people think, uh, and don't you know need their approval. That was another really big uh, aspect behind the film. I mean, the film again was so much of a blank slate. I think a lot of people projected onto it. But I think that if you're going to tackle these kind of uh, really in, uh, adult messages and themes, or let's say sophisticated themes, I think uh, kids can handle them, but if you're going to be approaching these things in family entertainment, you just need to take the time to do it properly. Uh, I, I think it's great. I applaud them exploring them. Pixar has had tremendous ex success exploring these kinds of more mature themes, uh, yet also I many times said I thought Pixar was a little emotionally manipulative. I think it takes on these big themes to almost create a sense of importance about their films. And sometimes it works and sometimes it just seems formulaic. So, you know, even even someone who's experienced as Pixar can get this wrong. It's hard to do. And even indie films often get it wrong. I did not like The Imitation Game. I thought that was very formulaic as well. And I think it also missed, missed really important areas where it could have created a great message and driven that home. So I would say that any movie, even in animated movie, but it needs to understand what its priorities are, it needs to have the time to explore all of them, and maybe these animated movies should consider having smaller casts so they can really focus on the important messages that they want to get across and character development uh, instead of, you know, but it's hard to argue with success. Both Frozen and Big Hero 6 are quite successful, but I think that this trend of being like, hey, well, I kind of see what the movie's trying to do, and even though it didn't succeed, I applaud it for it. That's great for now. That's great when audiences want to send movie making in a certain direction, but at some point, these studios and filmmakers have to get the hang of it. We can't keep making allowances for them only doing, you know, half the job. So it's great to see these themes introduced in these kind of environments. It's great. I think that's what people are excited about. But I think that, and again, it's not subtlety. I don't think it's subtlety at all. I think it's lack of time. And I think it's uh, too much to, too much to do. Not enough time, not only because of running length, but because of how much they're trying to shoehorn into the film. But I'm curious, what do you think? Do you enjoy more adult themes in your animated fair? I mean, I think that the Lego movie did a fantastic job, and I think that's probably why it's a front runner. It's a beautiful message about childhood and how, how you should play and adults, what it means to be a child in play, an adult in play. I mean, I thought that was really great stuff. And that movie did a great job accomplishing all of it. And it had a big cast, but you'll notice that not too many of them were developed that much. They did have more distinguishable leads. Uh, so so that, that's, my, that's my thoughts on it. It's a tough discussion to have. And again, you know, it's a, it's a gray area. I'm sure some of you will think that these um, subjects were explored quite successfully in these films. Uh, but I think we all can agree. I'm interested, actually. Maybe we can't all agree. I think the Lego movie does the best job. And I'm curious to what you guys think. What do you think does a better job exploring its more mature themes? The Lego movie or, let's say, Big Hero 6, because those are the big awards contenders. And throw in How to Train Your Dragon 2 there as well. That's your Oscar lineup right there. Which movie do you think does the best job accomplishing everything it's set out to do? My money's on the Lego movie, but we'll see. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's Morning Movie News. Write what you think of today's top three stories and the viewer question down below. Let me know what you'd like to see covered on Wednesday. Tomorrow, uh, I have to be out of the office all day, but I have a special editorial episode of Morning Movie News. I hope that you'll enjoy. Uh, and also, of course, as always, uh, write any questions down below that you would like to have me answer. All right, thanks for watching. Bye.